This evening's speaker is Franklin Sills, who for all the craniosacral therapists out there really doesn't need very much introduction at all. Franklin is the early pioneer in the worldwide development of biodynamic craniosacral therapy. He has influenced many of the current teachers. He has trained many of the current teachers. Um, Franklin started uh, a BCST practitioner training program at the Karuna Institute in Devon in the UK. And he was also a founder of us here at CTT in London. He has also helped start foundation trainings in Colorado, New York City, Switzerland, and he continues to teach uh, various postgraduate courses. He is the author of many books, including The Polarity Process, Being and Becoming, and Foundations in Craniosacral Biodynamics, Volumes 1 and 2, which are both seminal texts in the field of BCST. I have had the complete pleasure of having Franklin teach as a guest tutor when I was a student many moons ago. And uh, it gives me really heartfelt pleasure to introduce to you the wonderful Franklin Sill. Well, hello. Wow, thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, in this very strange time we have been in over the last number of months and still are. And I really, really wish everybody well and, and everyone has been well and friends and family are well. And um, just to acknowledge the, you know, oh, my heart's going and oh, the intensity of this time we have found ourselves in. And um, I did a lot of training in, in, uh, in, the, 70s, in the 60s and 70s, uh, really into the 80s in, in the Buddhist uh, tradition, which was very helpful for me at the time, certainly. And you know, the Buddhist shared life is conditional in nature. Right? You can't have life without conditions. And we're in very, in some ways, very, very intense, intense conditions. And the question is not, not having conditions, but how are we in the midst of the conditions, even in these intense times? Can we find connection? Can we come into our hearts a bit, which we'll do a little bit in the presentation. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge the times we're in and appreciate you all for attending. My intention is, is to do a kind of PowerPoint presentation with various images. Uh, and it's really about the nature of um, biodynamics, cranial sacral biodynamics. Um, and, uh, and let's see where we all go together. So I'll share my screen and you, you can let me know how that is for everyone. Can you see my screen okay? That's great. Thanks, Franklin. Okay, thank you. So my presentation, which I hope is, isn't too much, but we'll see how, how we go with time, because I want to leave some time at the end, certainly for questions. But the idea, you know, we're, we're a very mixed crowd. About 70 something percent are, are cranial sacral therapists and maybe different backgrounds that you're from. And there's some health practitioners and other people. So just, you know, again, much appreciations for your, for your interest or curiosity. And um, I'm going to be talking about uh, 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 biodynamic basics and what I call the holistic shift, which in work uh, we do with clients is about helping a person's system really settle and deepen and, and re really deepen out of patterns and faster, faster what's called rhythms into a deeper place of uh, a, a, a sense of support and, what, and also the deeper forces of life come more to the forefront. So taking a breath. <sighs> Let's see if I can, oh, it's not, oh, I see it. I maybe have to do here. 
There we go. So my, my first image is an image of, 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 of Dr. Randolph Stone. Um, way back in the 1970s, I got involved in a group of people in California who were really in, into his work. And I met people like um, Ray Castellino, who you may know, Jim Fio, and, and, and others. And, and it, it really, uh, I had done, I had been in therapy um, really from, from, from about 1969. I re really needed to go in and process a lot of stuff in myself when I was young. It was quite powerful. And then I realized how much body work was so important for me because I was holding so much in my body because that's, that's true for us all. We're actually body-oriented be body oriented beings. And then I, I met people who were in, into Randall Stone's work and it really, really, really got me involved in, in body work. He, he developed something called polarity therapy, which some people may be familiar with. And in that, in the way it was taught to me a long time ago, we would all, there were also holes, there were some cranial holes and other holes where you entered a deeper state of stillness. Dr. Stone called entering the neutral essence, the ground state. And that, that really got me interested in deeper forces. And um, around 1982, I, I went to osteopathic college and I got into various ways of working. Uh, and uh, I did osteopathic apprenticeship, which was, which was very interesting. And that, so he, he got me going. So, and I just wanted to acknowledge uh, Claire, uh, Claire Doby, who I met in osteopathic college, and she encouraged me back in 1986, 87 to start a training which was more oriented to uh, the life forces in craniosacral therapy to what, what is known as biodynamics. Um, and it was sort of like fools rush in where wise people fear to tread. I, I, I saw a training Claire was helping at the time. Dear Claire has passed away a number of years ago. I just wanted to, I just wanted to acknowledge her. And she certainly was an, an, an important teacher in, in the work. So she, she, she really got me started and going. And so let's take a breath and um, just acknowledge William Garner Sutherland. Um, he was an osteopath. He went. He was an osteopath at college in the early 20th century, and he says he was looking at a, a temporal bone, which is the, which is the, the bones on the side of the head, and it's very striated and very interesting looking. And the words came to him when he was looking at this temporal bone, beveled like the gills of a fish for primary respiration. Whoa! whoa. So primary respiration that started him off on a life a life journey. And uh, he, he did all sorts of things that I read about where he, he, he was interested in cranial bones he, because he was taught they were fused, but he thought they could move. So, so he, 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 he developed this helmet and to see what happens if he would put pressure on the bones and all sorts of things happened for him. And in, in the end, he started to sense deeper expressions of life, which he called the tide, the fluid tide, and he sensed tissues almost being breathed within the fluids. And it was quite, quite very, very powerful. So um, just to, it's important to acknowledge for, you know, however you're in the work or whoever's in the work, he really brought it out. And here, here's a quote from him, Sutherland's thoughts, which is quite, quite an amazing quote when I first read this a long time ago. There is an invisible element that I call the breath of life. The breath of life is perhaps sort of like, and we'll look at that a bit, perhaps it, it's like in Christianity, the Holy Spirit, the, the presence from which all things emerge. I want you to visualize this breath of life as a fluid within the fluid. 
something that makes it move, that makes life move, really, visualize a potency, an intelligent potency that is more intelligent than your own human mentality. So potency was his term for the embodied life force. And we'll look at that in a little while. The tide fluctuates. It ebbs and flows, comes in and comes out like the tide of the ocean. You, you can sense a, a, a deeper tide within ourselves. And we'll, we'll do a little meditation to see what, what we all can sense together, no matter what our background is. You will have observed this potency, its power, and its intelligence spelt with a capital I. So, that this intelli- so the forces of life have an intelligence. They maintain a form throughout life. We have this incredible world we're living in. May, may we all be safe and well in this incredible world. It is something that you can depend upon to do the work for you. In other words, don't try to drive the mechanism through any external forces. Rely upon the tide. And another little quote from him, use no force from without, let the unerring potency do the work. And very early on when I was in um, osteopathic, apprenticeship that there was an osteopath there who really helped me settle into this a bit. So I just wanted to acknowledge Sutherland's thoughts. It was very, very, very powerful. And this idea of potency, of an intelligent embodied life force. So the breath of life, this is a wonderful image from the Hubble, Hubble telescope. A mysterious essence which generates the ordering forces of life. And again, Southern call those forces primary respiration. And just an incredible presence. Um, and an and, and incredible presence. <coughs> Excuse me. Someone talked about an experience he had in 1945 where he was called into. Uh, a person's house, a man who was in the process of passing away, his family was around, they were very anxious. And he, he held a very wide field because he had to, because his family was around. Um, you know, a lot of times you're taught to narrow attention to do things, but he had to hold a wide field. And he felt a deepening stillness, so those stillness came to the forefront. And then he said he felt this presence, this, this spiritual presence, this breath of life that came and seemed to lift the man's spirit away and actually cast his heart open in love. And I, I had an experience like that a long time ago now when I was in a very busy practice, and in, in this, this is in the 1980s, and I, I, I was referred to an older woman. She isn't so old now. She, she's, she's actually younger than I am now. How did I, how did that happen? I'm 73. I think she was, she thinks she was 70 at, at the time. And she had such a story to tell me. So for about five or six sessions, we, I just had to listen to her story before we could even move, move to the table. And she had been, uh, she had escaped from um, the um, Nazis in the beginning of the second World War. She was young. Her family told her to leave. She, she was a young teenager. She, she walked across Europe in the midst of the horror of the war. She got an incredibly brave French fisherman to ferry her across the English Channel. And she had relatives in London. And oh God, what a story she told. And she was quite, she was quite protected in many ways. And it's very, 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 very powerful. And in one session with her, I had this experience with maybe about 10 sessions down the line or something. She was seeing me once a week. I did have this feeling of this, of this presence, this almost, whoa, this, I can't explain. And my heart was cast open. Her heart was cast open. And both our lives changed. It was absolutely beautiful. Oh, that's my heart's going. Yeah, and you know, boy, the things life brings us in so many ways. So the breath of life is this, <coughs> excuse me, vast spiritual essence from which all things emerge. 
And I'd like to talk a little bit now about primary respiration, what Sutherland called primary respiration, a deeper inner breath that's both energetic, fluidic, cellular, and it's with us really from the beginnings of, of life. <coughs> Excuse me, I, I have a little hay fever, so bear with me. So here's a kind of linear way of looking at primary respiration. Starting from the ground, it's just not at the bottom, but it's a ground state of dynamic stillness. Um, the term dynamic stillness comes from, I think, Dr. Roland Becker's work, where he talked about a stillness that is both dynamic and alive. And from this ground of stillness emerges a very deep, slow expression, a kind of impulse, a sense very, very slow, moving through everything. And he is suddenly called it the ground swell. It's like, and from, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> and from the ground swell emerges expressions of primary respiration. And the, the wide expression is called the tide or the large tide or the long tide. And it's a totally stable expression of uh, the primary respiration. It's a field experience. If you settle and widen deeply and really enter a state of stillness, you may sense this very, this impulse moving towards you for 50 seconds and away from you for 50 seconds. Let's see if I can sense my long tie just now or the tie that supports me just now, that wider sense. Ooh, I'm, I'm in the, what's called the exhalation phase, movement towards the center and vibing down. Ooh, thank you. <laughs> and from the long tide, from this wide tidal expression, that there's what suddenly was talked about this in a little while called the transmutation or change in state from the wider tide into the fluids of the body, again generating what he called potency. And that generates the fluid tide, or also called mid tide which is about, and it's more of an embodied expression of time. Maybe we'll do a little meditation later and see if we can sense that in ourselves. And then as we, right from the beginning of conception, we meet conditions of life, the potency of the life force will manifest um, to protect us in various ways to make coalesce or densify, or, and, and waveforms are generated. And on the surface, you may feel a much faster rhythm, classically called the cranial rhythmic impulse or cranial rhythm. The cranial rhythm is not a tide. It's more like waves on top of the tide. It's not stable. <clears throat> and it's usually around six to 14 cycles a minute, something like that. Whereas the fluid tide is more like, like around 12 to 15 seconds of what's called inhalation, 12 to 15 seconds of exhalation. We'll, we'll, we'll see if we can sense that later in ourselves. So, so these are the levels of primary respiration, but it's, they're not, the primary respiration really isn't about levels, it's more about fields. Fields within fields within fields. So here we have the vast field of dynamic stillness, the vast field of the universe we're in, and we have our physical body manifesting what Southern called motility, deeper cellular movement, sorry, the breath really. We have a field of potency within the fluids that generates a field called the fluid field of fluid body that generates what's called the fluid tide, the, the embodied expression of primary respiration. I'll just check to see if I can sense more in just now. I'm in its inhalation phase. It's nice to feel it actually. So there's that quality of fluid field, fluid potency field. And that's suspended in the large tidal field again, the long tide. And, and this beautiful torus shaped field is, is, is quite powerful. Um, there's been various research that shows that energy, torus shaped energetic fields organize life really. So that, that's, that's quite a powerful image. And it, you know, uh, this powerful quality of 
fields within fields. So again, think of the various tides, motility as field states rather than linear states. So let's, let's take a breath. See how, see how we go. So, a little bit more specific about the various tides. Long tide, again, is the underlying support of all life. It manifests in 100 second cycles, 50 seconds of inhalation is kind of rising, filling, streaming, 50 seconds of exhalation is totally stable. And we'll look at some old research about it, which is quite, quite extraordinary. So I'm going to just go blow my nose, it's my hay fever. So it's totally stable. It can feel locally like wind-like forces. In the Tibetan system, they actually call it the, um, the, the unconditional winds of the vital forces. And to sense it, you need a very grounded, very embodied and wide awareness, field, perceptual field, field of awareness. So how is long tide sensed? It's similar to what in the Chinese, some Chinese systems is called cosmic qi. A long time ago, I studied qigong and tai chi in California with this one wonderful qigong tai chi master, Sifu Feng Ha. He, he passed away um, a year or so ago. Um, he was 92 or so. And, but he really helped me sense deeper forces in, in an embodied way. And long tide is sensed again as a stable tide-like, wind-like streaming towards and away from your midline, your center line. Again, 50 seconds inhalation, 50 seconds exhalation. One powerful thing in work, also in your meditation, but it may feel as though your client becomes suspended in space in this huge field. So they enter, they enter more uh, holistic suspensory quality. And again, the Tibetans call a similar thing to long time, the unconditional winds of the vital, vital forces. And again, a long time ago in, uh, <coughs> oh God, in the 70s, I did a training at a Tibetan center uh, in something called Kumne, which is for very aware uh, movement practices, and then you sense deeper expressions and movements. <clears throat> and they talked about the unconditional winds of the vital forces. So subtle end from that, so I'm just taking a drink of water. Talked about a transmutation, that was his term, which means change in state. So there's a transmutation or change in state from the long tide into the body's fluids, generating potency, <clears throat> that embodied life force. And so that, that was his term for that trans, that change in state, that, that movement into the body. And that, that manifests, again, a potency. Again, it's an embodied life force. And uh, in the Chinese system, they also call potency jing, which is an interesting term. It means vital essence. <coughs> Excuse me. And Sutherland talked about an ignition, a lighting up of the potency in the fluids of the, the body. So you have the sense of ignition, of lighting up. And in a way, that's with us all the time. We can perhaps sense something, you know, lighting us up at times, or sense the light. We're not, we're not separate, if you like, from, from the light. So there's an ignition of, of life force in, in, in the fluids, that lighting up. Um, they, I, I remember seeing some research that they did, did around uh, uh, conception, and they actually noticed like a lighting up of the conceptus just at the time of, 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 of conception, like a field of light emerging. We're very powerful territories. We are creatures of light. That's nice, nice to remember in, our, in the midst of 
our, our conditions and wherever we become, our condition sense of world and self, that there's deeper, deeper truth and essence within us. <coughs> Excuse me. I may have to get another lozenger, but we'll see how we go. So, fluid tide. And again, you, you can sense the fluid tide as a relatively stable, holistic tide-like motion within your fluids, within the tissues, and your local field. The organizing forces express potency. And again, it, it's quite powerful. The, the field of potency is holistic, but it also will manifest protective processes or in terms of the conditions. So we'll have, have a look at that, hopefully, in a few minutes. <coughs> Excuse me. How is fluidized sense? Potency is an intrinsic force. You can, you can sense that within yourself if you settle. Fluid tide is a slow rhythmic tide like motion throughout the fluids and body. And the tissues are organized by those vital forces. <coughs> Excuse me. And manifest motility again. Commonly, fluid tide is 12 to 15 seconds of inhalation, 12 to 15 seconds of exhalation. It can vary. It can also close down it can go in, in, into protective stasis. Or, or, it's all very powerful and the practitioners learn to sense these things to help a person's system process what they need to. It, it's important to have appropriate verbal and trauma skills with that, of course, and to, to really help the person's the you know, nervous system clear to settle. And then you start and you may sense these deeper tides coming through. And my, my experience, <clears throat> it can take it could take at least six sessions to help a person start to process things and, and be able to, to, to go, enter the, 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 the deeper tides to come out of all the condition processes and the CRI qualities. And the, it's always there underneath, so to speak. And we'll, we'll, we'll have a look at that. So again, here we have fields within fields. And again, the tides express as fields within fields, physical body, physical field, fluid potency field, fluid field, and the wider tidal field. And that's with us throughout life. And here we have a wonderful image from Leonard Nielsen, which I have been allowed to use. And this beautiful of maybe five week old embryo. Look, look at the size of the embryo's heart. Isn't that extraordinary? How well, we're almost holding our hearts. You know, it's quite extraordinary. And just with this feel, this, you know, the, the sense of a very fluid physical body, suspended in the fluid body, of course, suspended in the wider tidal body, right from the, from the beginning. Let's do a little meditation together. <clears throat> so let's settle. Take a breath. Notice how you're sitting, maybe you're sitting on a chair, feel the floor, feel your feet on the floor, or whatever you're, however you're sitting or sitting on. Let your awareness start to settle in, in, into your body. Let's go take a breath. Ah, becoming aware, maybe letting your awareness rest in your heart area. If you have a sense of what's called midline or center line, maybe resting along your center line or midline, resting in your heart area. And, and just with this widening awareness. So just letting your sense go, your, your awareness get a sense of your body widening. So you have your sense of cells and tissues, physical body. Imagine that you're suspended in this fluid field, you know, like this embryo suspended in an amniotic sac, if you like. And imagine that there's also a wider field we're suspended in field within field within field. And let's let's settle and bring your awareness around your center line, midline, heart center, and let, let it widen. 
and rest for a moment. So let your awareness be suspended in the wider field, if you like, and rest. And really imagine you're, 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 you're suspended in fluid and your awareness is resting in that quality of fluidity and fluid field. And without looking for anything, just let your awareness settle. And let your awareness be suspended in that fluid field, that wider field. And notice over the next few minutes, if you sense a quality of what's called primary inhalation, a sense of rising filling, I'm actually in my inhalation phase. Or a sense of settling, receding, what's called exhalation. Again, use your own 12 to 15 seconds if your tide is expressing at that level, and at fluid tide level. So let's hold ourselves widely. Imagine we're suspended in fluid letting our awareness be resting and just see if our awareness is moved. So don't look for anything. Just let your awareness be suspended. Do you have a sense of a tide-like breath? And for some of the cranial psychotherapists, practitioners out there may be familiar. For some people it may be something new. So just bring some curiosity, if you like, to it. <clears throat> Resting. So just that quality of settling, softening, deepening, receiving. Just take a couple of minutes to rest here. If you find your mind is really, really moving, just, just you're going to rest and settle. Again, settling and deepening, receiving. And just letting that be for now. Just slowly, slowly coming back, if you like. Opening your eyes if they're closed. And maybe just looking around your space, your room, reorienting. And coming back into the present time, back into present time awareness, orienting where we are. And however that was, just acknowledging that for yourself, Okay, thank you. So taking a breath. Hopefully we're ready to move on a bit. I thought that was, you know, just, just to get a little hint 
And you know, that, that's not, uh, that, that could be a very useful meditation to do yourself um, during the day, also acknowledging whatever you need to, to process with that. I find I really have to work with my, my body every day. I do some qigong practice, some breathing work each day. So I find I really need to help have my body express what it needs to and move and breathe with it. So just to acknowledge that. So take a breath and we'll just move on to the next image. So uh, again, Sutherland was quite, quite amazing. He, 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 used, he, he also said, use no force from without let the unerring potency do the work. Again, I, th I, think, I, man I th think I mentioned that earlier. So let's look a bit more at potency. So we're gonna shift a bit. And I, uh, a long time ago, I, I, I talked about the three functions of potency, the three functions of our embodied life force, organizational, the embodied, Life forces, the potency, organizes our cells into form throughout life, really. Protective potency will coalesce to protect and, and also densify and generate what in uh, classic uh, work is called inertial fulcrums, which are areas of protection, really, where, un, where, where conditions and conditional forces are being held uh, as the best as possible. But, and also in stillness, especially potency manifest healing processes. So in session work, we really help the system enter what's called a state of balance, a deepening stillness around particular issues and things that emerge. So potency can change from a protective function to a healing, healing process. And that's something we really work with in training programs. So here's some, so some interesting research from Tufts University. <clears throat> I had, had the permission to use this slide. And it's a frog embryo. So if you especially look at this embryo, the, the lower one, and they, they did various studies that shows bioelectric exchanges moving the cells into place. And you, you, you see a midline forming. So it's quite amazing cells are being moved into place by bioelectric exchange in the fluids. So, so here's an image, of, this is quite speeded up. Um, but look at that amazing flow, that midline coming through, and that frog embryo forming. And here's a slower version of that. Again, these are bioelectric exchanges in the fluids. Look at that midline coming through and the, the cells flowing in the fluids. Well, quite, quite amazing. So that's the organizational function of potency. Quite, quite amazing. Oh, there we go. Great. So I hope that, I hope that, I hope that was powerful to see. <clears throat> we were all embryos at some time. We all flowed into form very, very, very powerfully. And hopefully we're still flowing into form uh, in the midst of our conditions. And here's a, just a little excerpt from research done by William Seifritz, University of Pennsylvania, 1953. This is just a little five minute excerpt. Uh, I hope you, you can hear him. He was Scottish. And in 1953, he did this research <coughs> on what, what's called slime mold, which is a primordial organism. It's basically protoplasm. And he discovered a constant streaming in 50 second cycles that's not affected by the conditions that he puts the poor slime mold through. So I hope you can hear his voice okay. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. I hit the wrong button, sorry. First commuter view of a small part of the whole, such as we would see if we used a hand lens. Remember, this is not tissue, not an aggregation of cells, but just protoplasm. And through it all, there is constant streaming. And now the protoplasm is seen through the microscope. 
The movement never ceases as long as there is life, except during hibernation in wintertime. Here is a younger portion of the plasmodium. Could we but understand the cause of this constant movement, we should be nearer to an understanding of what life is. I, 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 you know, I just, just think, Ross, isn't it an amazing statement? If we could understand this constant streaming, we'd be closer to understanding life itself. I just really wanted to acknowledge that. The protoplasm here flows <coughs> over the surface. Later, definite channels will be established. The granules which you see are nuclei, fat droplets, vacuoles, and bits of food. Here the plasmodium assumes its mature form, but even now the arteries are transitory, and soon the whole picture will change. Note particularly the reversal in direction of flow, with a rhythmic period of 50 seconds. That's the, the same as what we call the tide or long tide. In, in a primordial organism, it's, it, it's moving everything. This is a bit painful. We can not only dissect, but we inject with this delicate hypodermic needle, which is here nearly blowing a bubble. Let us inject a toxic salt. And Poor. you will see the protoplasm <laughs> suddenly stop. Beyond, out of the picture, the protoplasm flows on as before. Thus the protoplasm meets contingencies, heals itself, and thus saves itself. That's quite extraordinary. So, the, so locally, the fluids densify, and we call that the protective function of potency. And in his words, the protoplasm can, can protect itself and heal itself. It is quite, quite amazing and beautiful. <clears throat> we turn now to a typical medical problem, anesthesia. When the normal protoplasm is treated with carbon dioxide, it slowly goes to sleep. Here is another specimen. Now it too is slowly going to sleep. Now a few minutes later we get the first indications of recovery. And a quarter of an hour later almost the same culture back again. Healthy, normal protoplasm. And an hour later, we can't tell any difference between this protoplasm and that before anesthesia. Another specimen. It doesn't matter what I use to anesthetize protoplasm, ether, chloroform, cold, or I can even hit it on the head with little droplets of water. There you just saw the normal reversal in this culture. But in this case, it is carbon dioxide. But now the gas is on. So sudden a cessation of flow could occur only if the protoplasm has solidified. Here's still another patient under high magnification. We made a discovery that the rhythmic forces in protoplasm are even more basic than the flow. But when the protoplasm recovers, it doesn't just start flowing, it resumes as though it had been flowing all the while. In a moment now, the protoplasm slowly quiets down. Note that there is a slight nervous shock just before anesthesia takes place. Let me illustrate what I just said, that when the protoplasm recovers, it will be on the same curve. The rhythm has continued underneath, so to speak, even though the protoplasm has been asleep. There is still something going on. We must be very close indeed to the question, what is life? Again, that's quite beautiful to see. You have this, uh, this is the 50 second cycle, 100 second, you know, <clears throat> when the protoplasm was anesthetized, the uh, fluid densified, and when it came out of anesthesia, it started moving, but it moved because the long tide is underneath. That was not effective. 
and and it, it starts to move with the flow of long time where it would have been if it hadn't been put into anesthesia. That's quite quite powerful, really. Just just to acknowledge that. So ah, and we have this protective function of potency within us, within within life itself. Here's some illustrations from my book by Dominic de Granger. This is just showing the potency generating the fluid tide and tissue motility. And it, it, this is like uh, you know, the inhalation quality of, of it. So the tide breathes within the fluids and you know, within the whole field, actually. And the cranial rhythm impulse is zero against not actually tide. It's more like the waveforms on top of the tide. <clears throat> and again, if, you, if your perception, if your field awareness is, is narrow and you're looking at things, you generally will sense the CRI. You have to be, have a very grounded and stable, wide perceptual field, really settle in and, and come under, if you like, and just sense the emergence of the deeper tides. Here we again have our fields. And here's the CRI. So if we go back, here's physical body, fluid body, tidal body, and the CRI is more like waveforms on top of the tide. Whoa, that's fairly intense. I just looked at it now. Let's take a breath. And again, we can settle and settle under our conditions, really. And that, you know, I just have, a, I have 10 more minutes, I think. I wanted to acknowledge Roland Becker's work. Uh, again, he was the early president of the Southern Society. He oriented the work to what he called the inherent treatment plan, things arising from within. We can't figure out what needs to happen. We have to settle and deepen. And he said, wait until the system shifts to wholeness and primary respiration. And that can take a number of sessions with a person to, you know, as they process and clear things. I, I call that the holistic shift. And that's really the starting point of deepening into session work. And, and that can take a number of sessions to really help settle. Commonly, people need to process nervous system work and need to start to feel safe. One of the big things, again, is to feel relationally safe. When a person comes to see a, a practitioner, to see you if you're a practitioner, can they start to feel a, a safe relational field can, can that they can settle in? That, that's a big one. It's not about me doing things, but how do I hold them? How do I receive them? How do they feel received indeed? And the inherent treatment plan unfolds, <clears throat> and there's various stages to that. And just the preliminary phase, what I call the first settling, is again, the settling of relationship. That the person, the, the receiver, the client, whatever you want to call these really brave people who come to see us, or who come to see any practitioner, in suffering, of course, hoping to alleviate suffering in general. <clears throat> the first settling is, is, is relationship and feeling safe, being able to sense a safe relational feel. And that can take some time. Once that occurs over a number of sessions, we listen for the system to deepen and settle out of CRI, CRI waveforms, shifting that holistic shift territory. And then the practitioner settles into a receptive state oriented to primary respiration, <coughs> excuse me, the client's midline, the three fields or bodies. The, the, the first time I came across the term um, uh, um, bodies was from Dr. Stone. He talked about the elemental bodies, physical body, water body, fire body, fiery energies, air body, more the, the organizing fields, and, and the water etheric body, long tide, if you like. So I came across that term for, for, from Dr. Stone <coughs> a long time ago. Classically from, it, 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 especially in osteopathic practice, they talk about the three bodies or fields. It's a shift from conditions and the, the, and, and, and the CRI rhythms and rates 
into a deeper place again where, the, where healing processes can unfold and you sense that deeper sense of tide emerging. And so here we have, in this case, a picture of a person, of a um, practitioner sitting at the head of the table. I, I normally start sessions <coughs> settling the person after we settle it, 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 together. I, we, we do some resourcing work in chairs first. What tells you you're okay just now in the midst of everything. <coughs> Excuse me, I help the person settle on the table. I usually stand at the side of the table and just help them settle, remind them of their sense of resource. And then I usually go to the feet and make contact with the feet and negotiate that contact and, and widen my perceptual field. And from that, I, li I listen for the holistic shift to occur. Very commonly, when you first put your hands on the person's system, there's a lot of to and fro of conditional patterns. The more rapid uh, CRI might be there. And you're listening to that deepening shift into wholeness and primary respiration. And that they can almost feel like they're, the person's system's returning to that fluid embryo state, that, that kind of fluid, holistic state with so that Dr. Becker called wholeness and primary respiration. It really is a shift to wholeness, fluidity in primary respiration. And it, there's a sense of wholeness. It's, 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 it, you, you kind of come out of perceiving, well, this is there and that's there and this is this and this is that into this deepening sense of fluidity, that holistic shift. And it can feel like the person suspended in all fields, field within field within field, a deeper suspensory quality, which is quite, quite powerful. I'm sure many practitioners have sensed all of this in your work. Again, we have a mixed group of people who are watching, listening, much thanks to you all. And perhaps for many of you, this might be a review or familiar territory. For some, it might be new. Ah, and a last thing I'd like to do to start to finish is to acknowledge our heart field. And again, here's the huge heart, hearted embryo, which we were and still are really. And, and that takes me to the work of the heart math people. I, I, I think um, one of the, 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 the um, people who started heart math is Ron McCratty. I, I saw him do a presentation a long time ago. <coughs> and they discovered that the heart generates a huge energetic field. This is this torus-shaped field again. And the heart energy field is huge. <clears throat> and they did lots of research on, on the energetic field around the heart, which is larger than the field around the central nervous system. It, it, this huge heart field, heart, heart to heart, if you like. And then they also discovered, with all sorts of interesting research, that our heart fields are in, interconnected. And again, I have, um, that I asked the heart math a long time ago if, if I could use these images, and that was a long time ago. They said yes, <coughs> with, with acknowledgement that they come from, from heart math. And here we have two people, hearts generating heart fields that are in resonance, heart to heart, heart to heart resonating. And they, they discovered, even if, you, if these people have been in relationship, you take them to other parts of the world, their heart fields will still respond to each other. Um, but they've also, also discovered in, in the womb that little ones, the prenates in the wombs, their hearts are resonant with mother's hearts. As mother's heart rate changes, little one's hearts immediately change. If mom gets anxious, little one's heart immediately gets anxious. It's quite extraordinary. It's not just about hormones, but it's feel to feel re receptivity. So we could say at a heart level, we are all interconnected. And my heart goes out to us all 
in this in the strange time we find ourselves in. Really, really. Oh, so ah, may we all be well and happy. May we all be peaceful. May we all know a deeper inherent freedom at the heart of our hearts. I just wanted to acknowledge that. And maybe let's just settle and finish together for a couple of minutes before we enter question time. <coughs> if we settle in again and just come into our heart area and widen, and let's all rest in our hearts and widen our field of awareness just for another moment. Again, we, we did a little of this earlier, but really coming into heart-centered awareness and re receptivity. Breathing, acknowledging, heart to heart, if you like. <sighs> Just taking a breath, becoming aware. Okay, what is that? What's at the heart of me just now? What's important for me to be with and acknowledge at that heart level? Can I heartfully receive myself? Sometimes that's very challenging for some of us to receive and appreciate ourselves in the midst of things. Breathing, deepening for just another minute. Again, that quality of settling, softening, deepening, just receiving ourselves just for, for another minute before we, we shift to a question period. So thank you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, just taking a breath, and we can start to move into question time now. So I'll stop my screen share, and hopefully we're, you're back and just seeing me, I hope. Yes, yes we are. Okay, so thank you. So like we have some, got about a half hour for the questions. So you see what emerges from for you. So we have some quite a few questions coming in, Franklin. Uh, one from Michael asking, from your picture, the tidal field appears to be both within and extend beyond the body. Is Absolutely. Yes. So it's not just a physical fluid, but it's, the ener it's, it's, it's an energetic field. And the wider tidal field is huge if you like, the, 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 the tidal field, long tide, is, is a huge field, and we're all interconnected at that level. Um, I can remember a long time, and our hearts are very interconnected at that level. I can remember a long time ago, I can't remember how long it was, maybe 20 years ago now, or I, yeah, I can't remember. I remember in, it, it was the middle of the night, maybe two in the morning, and my heart started going mad, and my, since my heart field was going crazy, and I had to get out of bed. It wasn't a typical thing for me. And, and I, I, I did some meditation. I did a little Qigong practice to try to, to get my, my body settled. And I, I got back to sleep. And then the morning I found out that was just when the horrible Mumbai massacre happened in India. So I, there was a huge field of resonance. And my heart was sensing that at, at a, heart, a heart level. So our, our tidal fields and our heart fields are, are extensive. Our, 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 if you like, our fluid tide, our 
invite the tide makes a field around us or maybe a meter or so around us. And again, the long tide is, is, is a vast organizing field, not just for myself, but for, for, for all things, really. Hope that's helpful. Great, thank you. Another one here from Kate Franklin. It's um, in meditation, is it beneficial or irrelevant to allow the breath to synchronize with the mid tide? I, I wouldn't, yeah, I, I, it may happen naturally. I wouldn't worry, but, but, but to allow, yes, to allow your breath just, just to be, and, and it, it, may, it may deepen, it may synchronize with the tide. I, I wouldn't worry about that just that allowing that sense of deepening and, and the breath would start to resonate as it needs to. So, yeah, I mean, I, I went, I went, it may happen. I wouldn't worry about it. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, question here from David. How do the tidal bodies relate to the concept of the causal astral and etheric bodies? Whoa, what a question. I don't know. That's a wow. That's a, that's that that's a powerful full body. Well, I get. I that's part of a quest cover body. I said <laughs> that's a powerful question. Causal astral, and what, what what's the third causal astral and etheric? Etheric. Um, I, I I guess. I mean, I don't. I don't know. I, I guess the causal may maybe a physical body, fluid body, that which manifests uh, conditions. Then potency will coalesce to, to protect our whole field may feel dense the astral body may, may be the wider uh, sense of the long time now what was the third again astral core and the, the sorry etheric and etheric boy you know in, in the wider field um it you know that that, that third may be the, the deeper field of dynamic stillness, that, that which supports all, all form. Um, yeah, so uh, good question. I, I, a powerful question. I don't know, really, in, in, in those terms. I hope that was helpful, though, a bit. Thank you. Um, question here from Alex. Um, what is your current opinion or view on augmentation? Yeah, well, I mean, that the term the augmentation is really the, the augmentation of life force, of, 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 uh, of potency, and it's not about doing things to the to the tissues or whatever. Sometimes, <coughs> excuse me. Sometimes, as a practitioner, you feel a very a very clear what's called inertial fulcrum. Everything starts to organize around that, and you may enter a, a state of balance, but it may be a lot. Of, density and the only thing I, I, I tend to suggest that people do is, is that they meet that area and, and they stay in that sense of tidal body, fluid tide, wider tide and at the most they just let their hands breathe and if, if there's no fluid tide as though there's a quality of a deeper breath occurring and then and then settle and that might help the potency which is coalesced locally to start to express but again, you have you shouldn't have a narrow field. You have to have a nice wide field, you, 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 and you're just aware of that particular area. And remember, um, I didn't really talk about this, but wherever you have an inertial fulcrum, you have uh, a local area of potency or life force that's condensed to protect, and you have the conditional force that's that or or, or history that that's being that's being being protected, being protected, if you like, and as, as you settle, and potency can start to shift from protective to a healing function. You may start to feel things coming alive. If not, I may just let my hands breathe a bit, and that that may be enough to help the potency express. And, and if we've deepened into some stillness and safety, so that, that so the the only augmentation I suggest is when things are very dense in areas to help, you know, just to let your hands breathe a bit. And of course, uh, working in the beginning with, with what, what is classical called still point process. So really, I, I, I don't teach still point as a thing, but as really widening awareness, especially into long tight area, 
deepening into stillness and helping the person's system start to rest in that deeper stillness. And then you might know this potency starts to emerge from there. So I hope that's helpful. Great. Um, question here from Maria. What happens to the tide at the time of death? Oh, what a, what a question. Um, yeah. Um, whew. Well, there, there's so many levels to this question. It really is what happens to our consciousness. Do we have, a, a, do we have an embodied conscious, a spirit, a, a soul, whatever you want to call uh, that deeper deeper essence. And so the, the deeper question is what, what happens to the essence of me? I, I um, recently found an, an, an old translation in a book that was in my uh, 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 bookcase. And so that I, I, my eyes were caught oh, a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago now, or even, or even like, even a couple months ago at the beginning of lockdown and things, my eyes were caught by this red book. I go, oh, what is that? And I took it out and it was this lovely um, fabric covered book, which was an old translation of the Sutra of Huineng, which was, and Huineng was a Chinese uh, Chan master way back when, 600 years ago or something. And the Sutra w was uh, written of, of I have written down of, 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 of his discourses and he talked about just resting out of our, our conditions into a deeper essence of mind, a deeper essence of being. And so at the time of death, the big question for me is well, what, what, what occurs at, that, at, at, at the deeper level? Is there transition? Is there afterlife? What, what is the heart of our life? And that's, in the end, that's a great mystery for us all. Well, certainly for me. And uh, putting aside beliefs or whatever, or needs, yeah, that time of that transition to death is so, so, so powerful. What, 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 what tends to happen, the fluid tide tends to settle, uh, everything tends to settle, and, 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 and there is, at the time of death, a wind-like movement of the long tide, the last, if you like, inhalation of long tide. And, and classically, that's when the soul, the spirit, or consciousness leaves the body. Uh, so, uh, boy, but that, that's a huge inquiry for us all. What is life? What is, what is death? What's at the heart of our life? And, the, you know, again, the conditions we have to meet in life. How, how are we within those? Um, yeah, I hope that was helpful. Thank you. A question here from Lalita. What should we do on a daily basis to become a good practitioner? Whoa. <coughs> wow. Oh, thank you for the question. I, I, hope, <laughs> I really look at that in myself. Well, wow. Yeah, I mean, constant awareness. Boy, it's a constant learning process. Um, and, uh, you know, being as present as we can be for ourselves, doing whatever, whatever meditative process is helpful for us, the embodied process, movement process, really, really to help us ground and be, be present. Um, and, and, you know, what helps us be, and not just a better practitioner, if you like, but a, a better person um, and you know and, and to also appreciate ourselves that can, that can be challenging for for a lot of us can we appreciate uh, myself in life um, I get my um, dear wife um, Shariana um, Sharon Menzam who who's written a lovely introductory text to craniosacral biodynamics, but you know, it's not just for people who, who don't know about the word, uh, 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 practitioners really like it too. And, and um, uh, oh, I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> I lost it. 
Um, what, what, what was the question? Oh, I got carried away. What was the question, Tracy? Yeah, what we should do to become? Oh, yeah, like first, yeah, I got carried. Well, she, she's always reminding me. That's why. That's why I was just showing other. So, can I settle and 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 remember what to appreciate in in my life? And and sometimes just ask, okay, well, what are what what are what are what are the three appreciations? And I'll just settle. Ah, so in the midst of whatever the conditions are and what what we're dealing with, can we settle? Uh, forms of meditation are helpful. See what helps you settle. Um, and uh, I, I find the uh, title meditation is quite quite helpful for me. Again, I do I do qigong practice. I find all of that has helped me in the past to be a, a better, more grounded practitioner. So whatever helps us ground, whatever helps us deepen, and in the end, whatever helps us to be present. And when we're with a client, and this maybe you know with another person, period, but certainly when we're with a client, can I come out of my conditions and be present? Can I hold the person heartfully? And can I help generate a safe relational field? And that, that takes me being able to be settled and present. So again, whatever helps me on a daily level to set, be settled, to be present, to, to become aware, to feel ground again. So that helps me in all those ways will also help me be a, a grounded uh, practitioner, not to become involved and, and activated by the person's process or activation, but really to settle, to bring my work into my own therapy for myself <clears throat> or into, into, in, into supervision. So it's important for practitioners to have supervisors and supervision. Um, I, uh, I do supervision for um, um, uh, 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 practitioners who, who I know in, in, uh, in the past, I have my own supervision from, for myself. And um, supervision isn't about someone telling you what to do, but helping you to be present in your practice in your life and yourself to acknowledge what you need to and to also hold particular clients in in inquiry so so all that is, is you know we will also help a person be you know ground in being a practitioner in their practice great great thank you um the next question franklin has come up quite from quite a number of people so um, what do you feel about distant uh, BCST at this time to offer our skills during social spaciousness? Yeah. Well, I mean, this is something that's really come up a lot. Um, Sherry and myself did a presentation to the, um, to, to the Biodynamic Cranial Sacred Therapy Association of North America, which is all about, which was, they wanted us to talk about online work. <coughs> um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the association here is saying that you can't call your online work craniosacral therapy. I, I, I've been telling supervisees to, 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 to call the sessions resourcing and supportive sessions, because that's what they are. And, <clears throat> and, and you know, even if I'm seeing someone online, I, I stopped doing session work oh, probably, probably three or four years ago, just as part of my coming into semi-retirement, I still do some supervision therapists, however. Um, but, um, oh God, I, I, I got lost again. Oh, I see. What, 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 was that? what was the question? I forgot. Um, what, what did the person ask, Tracy? Yeah, we were asking about um, distant BCST. Oh, distance, yeah. Blah, 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 blah. I went distant, obviously, didn't I? Um, so, uh, you yeah, know, so, so, so even when I'm sensing someone on, online, I, I can feel, remember, feel to feel. If it's someone who, who I know that there'll be feel, uh, a field resonance, I can help a person settle. Um, I, I did... Um, 
some session work with someone who, who, who I know who really needed it. I just, I really helped her settle. I, I, I settled with her. I, 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 can, I could sense the resonance of her process and feel. Uh, I, I, I really did, you know, you, it's important as any kind of practitioner that you have, that you have, that you have the appropriate verbal skills, the verbal trauma skills, that you can help a person settle and slow down, and be present. And yeah, and, and having all of that in place on, online. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I, I wouldn't call it craniosacral therapy, which is a touch therapy, but resourcing and supportive work, certainly. And um, many, many, so I do supervision practitioners, many practitioners, clients are still seeing them online just so they can settle and start feeling safe and, and uh, process things in relationship with, with the um, therapist, the practitioner's verbal skills, helping them settle and, and feel safe. And, and, and just remember again, <coughs> excuse me, that heart math, heart field, field to field resonance, that, that's there too. Um, it's important also as practitioner to really learn to differentiate our process from the other person. So sometimes a person's process, even online, could, could, can, can activate us. So we really have to be aware of our own process, put it to the side, be present, and hold that receptive heart-centered field. Um, and yeah, so on, in terms of online work, it, it's, it's not craniosacral therapy touch work, but it, it can be resourcing work. Um, I make sure that my, you know, in terms of their own, own support, I have my, my um, supervisees check in with their practitioner insurance, making sure they're, they're insured for online work. That, that, that is possible, but to, to really check that out to make sure we're in strange times you know, just now. Hope that's helpful. Great, thank you, Franklin. There was lots of questions around that. Right, I hope, I hope that, that, that was helpful. It, it's a big thing. Um, and yeah, and yeah, yeah, what I, I tend to do is just help, help the person settle, feel themselves. I, I, I do a little meditation, see if I can help them enter a, a holistic shift territory online where they feel more settled, come out of their fears and the, the processes that are emerging, that they can settle and deepen. And um, yeah, I, I can sense things happening in their body. I may help them bring their awareness to it and hold that widely. I may bring words. Well, I can let that area soften, expand, breathe with it, let your breath come into there. So things, things like that uh, uh, can be very, very supportive for people if, if, that, if, that's, if that's what they also are, are asking. Obviously, I can't. I, I can't touch a person because we're, we're, we're online, but I can certainly help them in their process. Yeah. A question here from Anne. Do you give feedback to the patient while you're treating them? Yeah, well, in terms of, it depends on what you mean by feedback. I, I don't generally tell a person about what I'm sensing or what their process is. I may be noticing something, then I'll ask them, what, what are you noticing just now in your body? What, 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 what sensations are present for you? Maybe a particular part of the body or something I'm sensing in general. So I, I always ask the person what, 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 they're, what they're aware of. <clears throat> I, I help them settle and, and remind them perhaps of their sense of resource, which we work with at the beginning of the session in chairs. So in, in the midst, whatever is present for you, what tells you you're okay just now, and um, I, 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 yeah, just to acknowledge, um, Peter Levine's work is incredibly helpful. It's, it's somatic experiencing work and and, and and trauma skills. We brought in at Karuna the idea of resourcing work and similar work well, in the late '80s, early '90s. So that that sense of helping a person settle again, get a sense of resource, can be incredibly helpful also. Great, thank you. Um, question here from Chantel. Is it possible to give yourself a treatment as you treat a client? And if so, is it recommended? Oh, that's interesting. Well, 
<laughs> I mean, that, again, that, that, that's a giant, that, that's a huge question in many ways. It's not that I'm giving myself a treatment, but as I settle and deepen and hold a wide field and, and I orient to the, to the tides, obviously the tides within me are responsive. So I, I may have a resonance with the person at that, at that level. And also my own process may um, move in various ways. Again, I don't, want to, I don't want to become my process. I want to put my process aside. But, you know, that, that, it, it, it's incredibly healing to be in that practitioner mode, if you like, where you're in a state of awareness and stillness and re receptivity and your own healing can, can occur there. I, 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 I certainly remember, I, I, I was quite busy when I was younger. I, I, I would kind of see 30, 35 people a week sometimes. How did I do that? And I was teaching. Um, and, but I, I, what was really important for me was with, 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 with all, all the, the sessions I was in was really to have a state of stillness within myself, of settledness, of differentiation, this is mine, that's theirs, <clears throat> of a sense of wellness and resource. And that, that is healing in a sense, as I, give, as I give sessions. It's not my session, but there's a resonance, if you like, feel to feel the, the potential of healing. Yeah, I hope that makes some sense. Great, thank you. Uh, question here from Nader. In reality, to be present during sessions and all the advice that you've just shared, how many sessions could a person do in a day? Well, that, that's a good, I think that's very personal. I, I think that, that that's a, that I, 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 I'd be careful with that, uh, seeing what you, 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 your own energies are. Um, again, I, I, when I was young, I, I'd probably give around six sessions a day, something like that. Um, sometimes seven, uh, like, like you know, you know, one, one day a week. Um, and I start slowing, slowing that down. Each session, uh, what well, the first session that, that uh, when I first meet a person can take about an hour and a half and you know, taking the case history, getting them settled doing a short table session. And then sessions after that, I, you know, I, I, I clock in, I used to clock in an hour of time. So we'd meet again in chairs for 10 minutes or so. I'd remind the resources, we'd move to the table. We'd settle into a session of maybe 40 minutes or so. And then we, we, we'd, I'd slowly help them reorient, come back into the room, into present time, and share a little bit. Not we all, we will take about an hour or, or so. Um, but I think it's very personal. And as I got older, I would do less sessions. Um, I would give myself more space. But to, to really to see a, you know, what your own personal needs are, what you can hold, what is holdable. Most of the people before um, I was seeing, uh, before the lockdown, all that, who were seeing clients, we're probably giving about four or five sessions a day, something like that. That's what yeah, that, that's what felt comfortable to them. So it's a very personal thing, but not to overdo it, I would say. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, question from Madeline. How do you work with someone when they say everything is fine, but clearly <laughs> it isn't? Yeah. Well, again, again, Madeline, that's powerful territory. Um, <sighs> boy. I, so first of all, I, I personally I would I would acknowledge oh that that's that's good to hear. When you, I'm just wondering when you say that what, what is that like for you just now? What what, you, what tells you you're okay? So I'd, so I'd move into that resource. What tells you you're okay? What what are are you noticing just now that <clears throat> that is you know, not ideal or perfect for you. I'm just wondering what's, what's really present here. So I just help the person come into the present and into sensory awareness. But I'd be careful not to do that, not to do that too fast, or I wouldn't make demands on the person. I'd go slow, um, you know, and, and, and just to see how things emerge really um, over time. Yeah, if that makes sense. 
Thank you, Franklin. We're just coming up towards time, but perhaps one last question here, uh, which is from Bridie. How do you see the field of uh, craniosacral therapy going forward over the coming years? Well, well, that's a you <laughs> that that throws me into the mystery of unknowing. You know, there's a wonderful um, Christian text uh, from the Middle Ages called "The Cloud of Unknowing," where a where a a, a teacher monk was was uh, teaching a younger monk. And he said, in order to know truth, you must enter a cloud of un unknowing. So that, that is quite powerful. Can, can I enter a cloud of unknowing and just let truth emerge uh, out of what's present now? So I don't know if that's helpful at all. <laughs> Um, thank you, Franklin. That was just absolutely wonderful. So enjoyed hearing you talk. Just to say there were loads of questions trying to filter through and catch some that we would have some time to answer. Some were a lot more in depth and um, haven't quite got there. But okay. lots of love for you. Lots of thanks coming up for you. Uh, we'll keep those messages so that we can pass them on so you can see them. Well, um, thank you so much. It's been wonderful to have you. I want to, to wish everybody well again, and may we all, may, our, may ourselves, our families, our friends, our, our, our whole field be, be, be safe and well in this, these very strange times. Bless you. Thank you, Franklin.